Let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 7. As you're turning to Genesis 7 and your eyes get down to the 11th verse with me, you're looking at the single most devastating event that ever has hit planet Earth. We're looking at the what I like to call an extinction-level event. And that's what the flood of Noah that's recorded in Genesis is all about. God sent this extinction-level event to the earth to judge the entire human race because they were completely given over to sin. And no one on the earth survived this event. No one in the ark perished, and no one on the earth survived. Amazing to think about, as we saw last week, not even the creeping slugs that made their way into the ark, not one of them perished, but not one air-breathing creature on the surface of the earth survived this catastrophic event. The evidence of the flood was left by God out. It's kind of like uh, you can always tell when the kids have been in the kitchen because, you know, there's jelly and butter and the knife and the crumbs. Well, God left the evidence of the flood as a mute testimony of his judgment against sin everywhere. In fact, one of the largest flood signs uh, we drove by in March, our family, we went by the drainage ditch that's 25 miles wide and a mile deep. We call it the Grand what? Canyon. Yeah. Have you ever thought of what, what amount of water would it take draining off to make hundreds of cubic miles of material in that whole runoff plane to to go. And where did it all go? I mean, the delta of the Colorado River down there, I mean, is nothing. I mean, you, you have to think about this in terms of the cataclysmic nature that God describes in his word. In the world that perished, and in the 23rd verse, if you slip down there with your eyes, it says, he destroyed all living things. In the world that perished of Genesis 6, 7, and 8. And remember, it it was a whole world that perished. Not a city, not a village, not a little region. Uh, I saw an interesting graphic that Ken Ham does, and it shows the the Christians who believe in a local flood because, you know, they don't want to buck the system. And so they just say, oh, it was local. And it shows the ark and all the mountains, and it's just like a cube of water, and everybody else is out, you know, under their palm tree. and, And Noah's, you know, in this little cube of water with the ark at the top. That's how foolish it is not to believe what it says here. That Look at verse 23. He destroyed, and this is God, destroying all living things which were on the face of the ground. Both man, cattle, creeping things, birds of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And for those that were in the flood, there was no escape from God's wrath. And, and just reading these verses conjures up chilling scenes of of flooding and of drowning. And beyond that, if you look at the 11th verse, there's a right in the middle, it says, uh, and on that day of the month, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open and that fountains of the great deep speaks of volcanism and, and, and volcanoes coming. And remember that the Bible describes the creation of the earth as the waters beneath And the waters above and the dry land appeared between them. So there was obviously subterranean great amounts of water as well as something above, this uh, canopy or whatever was up there of water. And when the volcanic action started bringing that superheated liquid rock up through that subterranean water, there were just paroxysms of explosions of geysers of, of boiling water and steam going up and just unbelievable, uh, thinking of the frantic rushing of all the inhabitants of the earth to ever diminishing higher ground. In fact, some of the dinosaur finds, it's amazing. You'll see, like down in the Andes Mountains, you'll see uh, rhinos and hippopotami and and uh, small mammals all, all crowding up, and they'll all be up squashed near the top of these mountains, squashed. Now, what were they doing? How did over millions of years all of them get squashed in the same place? You know, do you ever? Th- and why did they pick a mountain? Because they were going to the highest spot. Because they were running away from something. And every time you see fossils of of these uh, flood trapped creatures, you find them being frozen in in mid flight. I mean, there there are several fossils of dinosaurs giving. Uh, uh, 
actually either eating something, they're, they're, they've got it half in their mouth, or there's a fish inside of a fish that had just swallowed, or they're, they're laying their eggs and they're just squashed and fossilized right on the spot because this happened so climactically and they were cut off from breathing by the raging waters. Well, what I like, and look back at verse 11, is that the flood is history. You notice it says in 711, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month. Kind of sounds like, you know, Kirk giving the log on the Enterprise, you know, giving the star date. You know, this is postured as an historic event. The year, the month, the day it happened. The flood history is extremely well documented as a historic event because every single New Testament writer refers to these first 11 chapters. All the authors God used in the, in the New Testament, all of them refer to Genesis 1 through 11. Jesus himself quotes from seven of the 11 chapters. And we can safely conclude that every part of the New Testament and all the writers were confident that the first 11 chapters of Genesis and 6, 7, and 8, where we are right now, the flood, was a historic record that was accurate. But when you think about the events here of the great deep broken up in verse 11 and verse 23, God destroying all things, it's hard for us to measure that. I mean, there have been floods that have killed thousands in in history. There have been plagues like the great uh, Black Death of Europe that killed millions. But never has everyone except for eight people. Never has it annihilated the population of the world. Never was it an extinction-level event except for right here. And what happened on the ground during Noah's flood must have been beyond description because it wasn't just rain that was falling. Verse 11 says these fountains of the great deep were broken up and, and that volcanic activity compounded this whole cataclysmic nature of this. In fact, I enjoy reading some descriptions of what volcanoes can do. Uh, in fact, just like tornadoes and hurricanes, there's a, a volcanic explosive index, a VEI they call it, just like a, you know, an F5 uh, tornado. Well, there are VEI 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 volcanoes. Eight is the highest on their scale, so the flood was probably a nine. But, but I'd like to read to you about one, six, a sixth level volcano. I'll just read to you. The flood was the most, the max. But there's one in history 125 years ago called uh, Krakatoa. You ever heard of Krakatoa, the, the great explosion of that island in Indonesia? Back then it was called the, the Dutch East Indies. But in 1883, in August, on Monday morning, at two minutes after 10 o'clock a.m., a whole mountain exploded. And there was a lot of British uh, sea captains out there, and they uh, wrote down in their logs, because they were running around doing their stuff, they wrote down a very dramatic record. In fact, that event in 1883 was so great that Tennyson later would write a lot of his writings in London, in England, about the spectacular sunsets that all this volcanic uh, ash in the atmosphere caused the whole world to have these spectacular sunsets. But let me read to you from the logbooks of the sea captains how terrible one Category 6 volcano could be to people that are nearby. They write, the trading ships in the area were pounded all Sunday night by hot winds. The winds were full of flying cinders and ash. The night was fearful. It was full of the blinding fall of sand and stones, and the sky at one second would be intensely black, and then next it would be a blaze of light. And so it was kind of an eerie night that seemed long. Monday arrived, but the dawn never came. Instead, the skies stayed dark at dawn. Ash filled the air. Lightning flashed everywhere. As Monday morning wore on, Krakatoa's eruptions grew more intense. Beginning at 5.30 a.m., one captain logs that there were three terrible explosions that shook the air and generated immense and powerful waves. And so those that were out in the area around the island began to feel those initial blasts. And then at exactly two minutes past 10 a.m., one logged in his log, the unthinkable happened. Krakatoa disappeared into nothingness. The whole island was 11 miles long and 4 miles wide. Think about the loudest sound you've ever heard. Multiply that sound by thousands. A sound so deafening, an explosion so terrifyingly loud that people more than 2,000 
miles away heard it. Can you imagine hearing those fires that are out in Los Angeles all the way here? How scary that would be if you could hear a sound from 2,000 miles away? People 2,200 miles away in outlying British territories recorded hearing it. In fact, 500 miles away, buildings shook on the ground, not from an earthquake, but from the actual blast wave of this volcano and the island disappearing. Six cubic miles of rock were blasted up into the atmosphere. Clouds of gas, fire, smoke shot 20 miles into the sky. So it was just a column, an explosive column of all this um, pulverized and vaporized rock and water and and volcanic uh, eruptive stuff going up 20 miles into the sky. Amazing to think about. But underwater, the force of the volcano collapsing gave birth to a giant sea wave. Of course, we call them tsunamis. When it reached the villages and towns scattered on the coast, it broke on shore 100 feet high. Remember, we have an arc-sized 45-foot ceiling here. Twice this. Imagine standing on the ground and seeing a wall of mud and rock and water coming at you 100 feet high. That would be the last thing that you saw. But there was a surviving family. They were huddled in their cottage of uh, a city called Kettenbog, and later on rescuers found them, and this is what the rescuers said they said. After the volcano erupted, suddenly it became pitch black. We felt heavy pressure. We were thrown to the floor of our house. It seemed as if all the air was sucked away. We could not breathe, and then we began feeling the hot bite of pumice. That's the airborne little volcanic particles that is gas-filled lava, and it says it pricked and burned our lungs like needles. And they survived, but 165 towns and villages were destroyed with a total of more people killed in this volcanic eruption than any other in history. But that was a number six on the scale. And they're far more colossal and more devastating. In fact, scientists say this number six on the volcanic explosivity index, VEI, is colossal And it only occurs every few hundred years, thankfully. By the way, the next one, you know what they say the next biggest one's going to be? Yellowstone. Yellowstone. That has a caldera of of more, it's it's just one of the largest magma deposits ready to come out of anywhere. That's why Old Faithful's there, to remind us it's going to go at any moment. But think of devastation beyond imagination and multiply all known and observed volcanoes by thousands. Because look back at verse 11. It says, On that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. God triggered a ring of fire all the way around the world and all over under the ocean. These, these crustal uh, breakages came and, and this, this uh, geyser of, of superheated, vaporized water and, and volcanic rock started going. And it says in verse 23 that God used that to destroy all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man, cattle, creeping things, birds of the air. They were destroyed from the earth in this process. That's devastation beyond anything we can imagine. Uh, No one could escape the flood because God allowed the earth's crust to break up at the start of the flood. Huge eruptions under the oceans for thousands of miles literally boiled the oceans, releasing steam into the air along with volcanic ash. Immense tidal waves were created. It devastated every tree on earth. In fact, if this happened like it's written, what you would find would be thousands of square miles of forest all swept together and put down in mats. And you'd find those mats being very, very thick and squashed down and that they would contain vegetation from big trees and from ferns and from plants all swept together into low spots and squashed. And you would also find animals that would all be running to the highest point if this really happened. And what I just described are the coal beds and the fossil beds that we find on every continent in every part of this world. Because this event, God said, covered the whole earth. Remember those people that uh, brought their lawn chairs last time? Uh, We talked about Mr. and Mrs. Scoffer. Do you remember them? Well, did you know that they didn't just start with Noah? 
uh, those people were probably scoffing at Noah's grandfather, Enoch. Remember, Enoch was a preacher of righteousness. It says in Jude 14 and 15 that he preached and preached and preached, and they didn't listen to him. And they didn't listen to his dad either, Noah's great-grandfather. Noah's great-grandfather's name was Methuselah. That's what we say. We're just saying the, the Hebrew word. But if, if you heard him introduce himself, can you imagine? They'd come up and they'd say, Hi, who are you? And he says, When I die, it comes. And they go, What? He says, That's my name. When I die, it comes. And they go, When who dies? He says, When I die. What comes? The flood. Can you imagine God instructing Methuselah's parents to name him that? Lord, what should we name our son? Name him when it dies, it comes. Why? Well, because when he dies, it's going to come. And so little Methuselah, can you imagine him running around the first time he had a sneeze? I mean, they were just running and getting every cold remedy they could find because they didn't want it to come, whatever it was. But for a thousand years, the longest living human shows the grace of God. You know, that's part of that. With the Lord, a thousand years is as a day. The day of his wrath was coming, but he gave him a thousand years. And did you know God does that twice? Also, there's a millennium where God holds off his final burning the earth with fire for a thousand years while the day of his wrath tarries. Just amazing to think about. But in the Bible, foolishness could be described, the biblical term, as a willful refusal to accept God's explanation of reality. Okay, so foolishness is a willful refusal to accept God's explanation of reality. Noah and Enoch and Methuselah all told the people that God's reality was judgment was coming and people foolishly scoffed and didn't believe it and if you think about it today do most of the people on earth today believe that the creator of the universe after he created everything looked down and saw everybody was so bad that he killed them all except for eight do you think most people believe that do you think most people believe that god annihilated the entire human race and just left eight people alive to start the human race over again probably not Probably most people would think that's ridiculous. Evolutionary thought that most people have is based on uniformitarianism. That means no cataclysmic invasions by God. And that notion of a great global flood described in the Bible as an eyewitness historic record written by the only survivor in his family is laughed at and ignored. Yet it fills the Bible. In fact, if you ever want to study the flood... You can go all the way through the Bible. I'll just give you some of the verses. Job 12 and verse 15. It says this, The waters overturned the earth. It says in Psalm 29.10, God sat over the floods, enthroned as king, as the floods flooded the earth. So from God's perspective, on his throne, the whole earth was flooded. Psalm 104, verses 6 through 8 says, The flood was terminated as God carved out the ocean beds. And it's interesting, the word that, that is used in the Bible for ocean beds speaks of them not as being beds, plural, but one ocean that is connected by all of these, these uh, lower parts. It's one bed for all the oceans, and that's how God describes it. It says in Isaiah 54 and verse 9 that the waters of Noah went over all the earth. It says in Matthew 24 and verse 37 that the days of the flood are like the days when Christ comes. And Jesus goes on to say in verse 39, the flood took all of them away, all the inhabitants of the earth. It says in Luke 17, 27, the flood destroyed them all. It says where we were last week in 1 Peter 3, 20, only eight souls were saved by the ark. Remember the ark of safety. Those inside were protected from the wrath of God poured out on on the earth and those outside didn't make it. It says in 2 Peter 2, 5, in fact, let's, let's start turning back to 2 Peter because we're going to read chapter 3 in just a moment. But remember where 2 Peter is? It's right before Revelation. It goes 2nd, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. So go to Revelation and back up. Uh, but it says in 2 Peter chapter 2 and, and verse 5, it says, and, and did not spare, 2 Peter 2, 5, this is God, did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood on the world of the ungodly. So the world that perished, the whole world of the, of the inhabitants of the earth at Noah's time were destroyed. And then finally, look at Second Peter 3 and verse 6. And that's the passage we're going to read. But notice what it says in verse 6. 
by which the world that then existed perished. That's why I call it the world that perished. The world that Enoch and Methuselah and Noah grew up and built that ark in perished. Every part of it. All the animals, all the people, all the buildings, all the trees, everything in this flood. The world that then was perished by the watery cataclysm. What does the Bible say about people that don't believe that? Well, in 2 Peter chapter 3, God says people that don't believe that God destroyed the whole earth as he describes it with this watery cataclysmic judgment. He said that they are scoffers and that they are foolish because they refuse to believe what God records as reality. And that's what the whole 2 Peter chapter 3, the first nine verses are about. Let's read and listen to the Lord. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Verse 2, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let's bow together. Father, we bow before you because when we open your word, we come into your presence. And when we open our hearts, we can hear you speak. And you tell us as the only witness to all things that have happened, creation, the destruction of the flood, and the consummation of the universe, you, you are the witness. And your word is that historic record that we can trust, the book that we can trust. And I pray we might speak to our hearts as we examine the truth of your word today and the implications it has on us. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. I just want to go through these nine verses real quickly with you and kind of put a thought on each one. The first one is, in the first two verses, what Peter is saying to these people is that they are to trust the word. He talks about the Bible was spoken by holy prophets and apostles of the Lord. Now, now remember, don't ever just snatch a, a text out before you know what it's attached to. Peter, the apostle, was writing to, it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, the first book, the first verse says where he wrote these letters. He wrote them to Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, if you ever look at a map, those are regions of what we would call in modern times Turkey. And, and in Paul and Peter's day, this was the Roman province of Asia. Asia Minor, you might call it. It's the country of Turkey. In fact, if you go to Turkey today, you find more Roman buildings and cities than there are in Italy. You find more Greek temples than there are in Greece, and you find more biblical sites than there are in Israel. Turkey is, was the center of the Roman Empire back then as far as culturally, economically, and in civilization. It was very sophisticated. It was kind of the epicenter of Roman culture in the region of Asia Minor. Now, those people, when they came to Christ, began to suffer loss. The book of Hebrews says they suffered the loss of their goods because they were being persecuted for being Christians. And so Peter wrote his two letters to believers going through hard times. In fact, he calls it the fiery times. They they were actually going through really desperate financial times and emotional times and physical times. And he wrote them, and he uses the flood as a reminder, he says, hey, the God who destroyed the earth knows what you're going through, and someday he's going to judge the people that are giving you all this hard time. So he uses the flood as a, as a kind of a marker out there to show them the, the lot, the, the dimensions of what life is like, and that God is in charge. And so what he says, first of all, is trust the word. 
in verses 1 and 2. When God's Word records an event that God says happened, you can be sure it happened. And by the way, the apostles and prophets completely were convinced that when they spoke, they were not speaking what was on their mind, they were speaking what God told them. In fact, thousands of times it says in the Bible, thus says the Lord. And so when God writes down a record of a historic event like the flood, we can trust the word. Look at, look at verse 3, though. He says, you're in hard times, trust the word. But look at verse 3. Knowing this first, scoffers will come. In hard times, people like to attack our foundation. And so Peter says, they're attacking your foundation. They're scoffing at this record of the Bible. They're, they're saying it didn't happen. It's not true. Because sin hardens human hearts. And the more, the more that sin spreads, the more that that sinful creatures get immersed in their sin and they get harder to God. And so people who are hard-hearted mock and scoff at God's word. In fact, if you get to Revelation 9 and verse 21, when God is sending down 100-pound hailstones and just squashing people into little grease spots, you know, in the height of the tribulation, and he's just sent that angel and the angel's preaching the eternal gospel and people are seeing the wrath of God, do you know what they're doing? They're not repenting. It says in, in Revelation 9.21, neither would they repent of their sorceries and their murders and their fornications and their thefts, but they cursed God. You see, people, even with, with Jesus in front of them in his earthly ministry, even with the hand of God pouring out wrath in the tribulation, they refuse to believe. They don't want to repent. See, if you believe there's really a God who judged the earth with water, who's going to judge it with fire, you would want to get on the good side of him. And if he says repent, you would want to repent. And people don't want to. We should expect scoffers. Only when the waters were rising, when their only escape was beyond reach, only then did the people finally realize that their only hope was gone. We can expect the scoffers. But, but look at verse 4. This is the most fascinating thing that surfaces with the flood account, and that is what, what I like to call verse 4. Verses 1 and 2, trust the word. Verse 3, expect scoffers. Verse 4, resist the lie. What's the lie? Well, this is what the scoffers say, verse 4. They say, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, everything continues as it was from the beginning of creation. What they're saying is, hey, what are you talking about? God's God's left everything alone. He just wound this thing up and spun it off in the Big Bang. There's nothing. Is, there's been no intervention. See, they, they don't... That, that's why in verse 5 on it talks about they don't believe in the flood. Why? Because the flood is a huge bookend. God put it at this end and said, Hey, I judge sin. And there's another bookend coming. It's going to be the fire destroying the universe. And between those two, people are supposed to live looking back at the reminder of this and saying, I don't want to be swept away in the final judgment. I want to... Get in line with God. But what's the lie? Well, Satan's gospel that's believed around the world is Satan promoting some teachings. One thing Satan likes to promote that's right here in this fourth verse is the geological history of uniformitarianism. That's the geologic way of saying that the present processes we see in place right now have continued at the same rate. And so that's why they're always measuring things Based on the present, the present is the key to the past, is their, their mantra that they have. And that's one of Satan's lies. Also, another lie he has is the human origin of evolution and a religion of an impersonal God. He's not the creator, he's not involved. And a human pedigree with animal ancestry. How do you like that? I mean, if you have an animal in your background, you're not really that important. You're not eternal. You're not immortal. You're not made in the image of God. You're made in the image of an animal. So you know what you can do? You can sit in front of your webcam like two people did this week and commit suicide and have people watch you. Because who cares about your life? Because you don't care about it. And you can live like an animal because there's no judgment. And you can kill yourself and do whatever because you'll never face a God who will call into question your behavior. That's part of Satan's teaching. He says, you have a human pedigree with an animal ancestry and you live a life of chance. But that's not what the Bible says. In verse 4, God warns us, in the last days people are going to be say, everything has been going on from the beginning the same. Evolutionists, of course, tell us the earth has been in existence for millions of years. Life started evolving on the earth millions of years ago. Unfortunately, many Christians hold the same view. 
All they've done is become theistic evolutionists. So they take the whole evolutionary lie and they just put God in there. And they just say, you know, now we've got the best of both worlds. The world won't be upset at us and God won't either. And, and what they do is they hold this belief that, it, that there has been the same process going on for millions of years. The technical word used in geology for this belief is uniformitarianism. The, the, the layers are just laid down like this and you can just go down and see billions of years in the Grand Canyon. And they have no concept that the flood laid down all that and it wasn't hardened into rock yet and the biggest drainage ditch in the world was made by the runoff from the flood and it happened very precipitously and rapidly. That doesn't fit in the uniformitarian model. Geologists have the idea that the processes we see operating in the present world have been going on for millions of years at essentially the same rate. And they often say that the key to the past is the present. The evolutionists and the theistic evolutionists use that phrase. But the Bible claims to be the record of one who knows not only everything, but has also been there because he's outside of time. In fact, if you're in chapter 3, look at, at chapter 1 of uh, 2 Peter, verses 20 and 21. This is one of the more important verses describing inspiration, how we got the Bible. 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17 is one, and the other is 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. And what it says is in 20, knowing this first, no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man. The first point is this. People didn't just sit down and say, hey, I'm going to write a book of the Bible, and this is what I want to write, and this is, it's my private little revelation. No, God says no, no prophecy of Scripture came from an individual. They didn't conjure it up. They didn't think it up. But how did it get here? Verse 21 at the end. Holy men of God spoke as they, and the next word is so fascinating in Greek. It's the word pheromenoi, and pheromenoi means to be driven along by the wind. It's used of a sailboat that has its sail up and the wind blows it and pushes the boat. And so what God says, inspiration is the breath of God, Theopanoustos, breathing out and pheromenoi, moving men to write down. Forty different men were chosen by God and God breathed out through them and they wrote down God's word. Now you say, well, it was it automatic dictation like this? You know, and they had no... No part in it? No, each, each man brings up a little of his personality. If you read Luke, I mean, he's so graphic. I mean, he doesn't say people are sick. He tells what they have. It's almost a little too graphic. And, and if you read Paul, Paul was so sublime. He's a wordsmith. Peter is so rugged. He, his, if you translate Greek, Peter's writings are the hardest to translate because he just doesn't pay any attention to grammar or rules. He just pff, writes it down. And it's very hard to translate. But each of the men... It's the pure light of the Word of God shining through the stained glass windows of their lives. It retains the purity of the light, the revelation of God, but it picks up their personality. But that God claims that he moved through men to write down everything, and he wrote down exactly what happened. And the present is not the key to the past. Rather, the revelation of God in his Word is the key to the past. And the revelation in this book is from someone who was there. Not someone sitting somewhere writing a book trying to speculate. It's an eyewitness account of someone who is there. So God's truth in his word is an eyewitness history of a cataclysmic intervention, a supernatural origin by creation, the revelation of a personal God. Our human ancestry is in the image of God, and our life is to be lived in light of being designed for a purpose. Not by chance, not from an animal, but from the very image of God, to fulfill his purpose. So the word of God is true, and the Genesis flood was a world-covering cataclysmic judgment. So we should resist the lie. But look at verse 5. We don't just negatively resist that lie. We affirm our creator. They forgetfully, uh, willfully forget that God made the heavens and the earth was standing out of water and in water. Now if you look at most evolutionary I mean, go to Barnes & Noble and get one of those big books with the pictures of how the universe began, and they'll show you an explosion, then they'll show you this fiery blob of molten uh, rock and metal, and then it cools down and gets dark, and then somehow, spontaneously, water forms around it, and then it starts raining, and then, you know, all the stuff happens. Uh, Orogenesis, you know, it just comes from nothing. Nothing. 
But that's not how it is. So you know right away that's wrong because the Bible says, the eyewitness said, don't forget, by the word of God, the heavens were of old, verse 5, the earth standing out of water and in water. The earth was formed with water. And obviously there was water below the surface of the earth and there was water up somewhere in a vapor cloud. That's how they lived to be a thousand years old. They kind of were all wearing you know, sunblock because that water was deflecting a lot of the solar uh, radiation that is so harmful that, that lessens our lives. But we should affirm the Creator. God told us, He framed everything, He made everything, and we affirm and believe Him. Verse 6, by which the world perished that then existed. We should remember he's a judge. What Peter, you notice the succession. Peter says you're suffering. You you have scoffers coming at you. Trust the Bible. Expect they're going to scoff. Resist their lies. Affirm God created you for a purpose. And remember he is the judge who sees all things. We should be very cautious to realize God sees us. The fear of God is knowing he's going to call us into account for our lives. And so Peter says, You need to remember the judge. And verse 7, he says, you need to realize that only he can help you escape the fire. The heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire till the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The saddest lesson from Noah's day is that humans have changed very little in their attitude toward God. Jesus said, just like it was in days of Noah, it's going to be at the end. Mr. and Mrs. Scoffer were scoffing that God would ever judge. People today are scoffing that God ever did judge. Back then, they refused the offering of salvation. Today, they think they can save themselves. People change very little. But we should give them the gospel to escape the fire. But, but look at verses 8 and 9. What the Lord says is we should seek him as Savior. Seek the Savior. He is the God who is not willing, verse 9, that any should perish. He, he is the one who is long-suffering. He gave them Methuselah's life as a witness. He gave them Enoch's sermons as a, as a message of righteousness. He gave them Noah's longest sermon in recorded history, 100 and plus years of building that picture of, of salvation for them. God is not willing that any should perish. How do you keep people from perishing? You point them to the God whose arms are open to them, who so love them, and you tell them the ABCs of the gospel. In fact, I think a lot of Americans are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. That's the distance between what they know and what they've experienced in their heart. They admit, a lot of people admit they're sinners, they're good churchgoers, and they know that God says that, and they believe Christ died on the cross. But they're still not going to heaven. That's like demon faith. By the way, demons believe all that too. Demons know that they are sinful and so are we. And demons know Jesus died on the cross. In fact, they saw him come out of the tomb. They got a little up on us. They were there. They're not saved. Why? Because they do not, the C, the A is admit, the B is believe, the C is call on the name of the Lord. Many people know the gospel. They've just never received Jesus Christ. They're churchgoers. They're they're Bible encyclopedias. They've never cried out to Christ and said, I am a sinner. You, O Christ, are the only door. And I ask you to cleanse my sin. Forgive me. I come to you as my only hope. I call out to you. Save me now for Jesus' sake. They've never called on the name of the Lord. And the Bible says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. So what does Peter say? Trust God's word. Expect people are going to be scoffing it. Resist the lie. Affirm your creator. Remember he's the judge. And escape the fire by seeking the Savior. You know, believers have a great part in this too. Did you know the fires are going to destroy everything in our life? We've talked about that except what's done for Christ. And tonight we're going to roll into verse 9 onward in the context of of the fifth sign of Christ's return. Do you know what the fifth sign Jesus gave that you know you're near the end? When you can't buy or sell anything without a number. Now, pretty much today, about 70% of all transactions now are starting to be done with what? Yeah, electronic transfers and credit cards. Jesus said in, in Revelation 13, no one can buy or sell at the end of the world without a number. We're going to look at 
the whole global financial deal that's going on, how that's rolling us toward a global financial system. And then we're going to see from verse 9 onward how Christians, how they survive and not just survive, how they thrive as the world is coming to an end. Father in heaven, I pray that you would apply your word to our hearts, that we would live redemptively, that we would tell people about the Savior who is patiently waiting with arms outstretched to them, not willing that they should perish, and that anyone who will admit that they are a sinner, confessing that sin to you, and believe that you, O Christ, are the atoning sacrifice, and that will call upon your name, you, O God, have said they will be saved. And that just begins a life of living redemptively. And I pray as we see the signs of the end of the world that are in the news today, we don't know when you'll come, but we do know how we're supposed to live. Teach us to live that way every day. In the name of Jesus and for his glory we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You should go. 